so it looks like we've got a fair number of our attendees here um, and it's just about five after. A few more people will probably filter in as we get going. Um, but I think we're ready to start. So Tim, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, thanks, Anne. Thanks for setting this up. I really appreciate it. This is a fun talk for me to give because of my personal affection for Stewardia. <clears throat> and so today what I'm hoping to do is go through the Asiatic Stewardias specifically. I will mention there are two native North American Stewardias that we work uh, quite a bit with. Um, whoops, before we get started, I'm going to just remove my here to not distract from the <laughs> from the beauty of the slides themselves. Um, and Tim, can I interject? I forgot to say that if any of you have questions as we go through the presentation, you'll see a Q&A button. I think it'll probably be at the bottom of your screen if you're on. Yeah, there it is. A laptop. Um, if you're on a mobile device, you might have to tap your screen for it to show up. But feel free to enter questions as you think of them throughout the presentation, and we will try to answer as many as we can at the end. And back, back to you, Tim. Okay, thanks for bringing that forward. Um, <clears throat> yeah, please uh, save, save them to the end, but type them in now while you uh, have them. This uh, slide, the beginning slide, is the introduction slide, but it outlines the majority of the species that we're going to talk about today in detail, and along with some cultivated varieties. This one right here, my cursor's going over, is, is one that we've been cultivating since 2004. It's called the beaked stewardia, like a bird's beak. Uh, here is the most commonly cultivated stewardia, pseudocamellia, or the Japanese stewardia. And then over here is one of the really remarkable uh, species in North America of two, Stewardia malacodendron down here, the uh, mountain camellia, which is uh, Stewardia ovata, Stewardia sinensis, which indicates it's from China. And then we're also going to talk about hybrids in uh, their role of, of, in this uh, cultivated group. So we'll move forward. I'm not going to uh, bludgeon you with <laughs> botany, although I'd like to. Um, <clears throat> this is a list of the hardy Asiatic species, and I say hardy, uh, that we can grow. I will tell you there's more work being done on some more tender stewardias, and I'll mention that in a second, but there's 21 species worldwide. When we look at this group, in Japan and Korea in particular, uh, Stewardia monadelpha and Stewardia serrata are endemic just to, uh, to Japan, along with Stewardia pseudocamellia. But we do find, and this is something that's kind of a, a big part of the story, a variant called Coriana, Stewardia pseudocamellia coriana, which I'm convinced 99% uh, of stewardias that have been produced in the United States or sold in nurseries are actually of Korean origin. I'll get into that in more greater detail. They're all reliable to zone 7B. Um, here on Martha's Vineyard, we're zone 7A. When you go over to China, you find two species, Stewardia sinensis and Stewardia rostrata, Stewardia rostrata, Actually, a deeper story with that named by our director emeritus, Steven Spomberg. So let's go and look at the rest of the story. As I mentioned, there are a lot of them actually that we can't grow. And for the longest time, a lot of story is that we would more or less call, I don't, know, I don't like the word subtropical, but from very warm regions of uh, China, in particular Yunnan, for instance, Stewardia unanensis and Stewardia pteropetiolata, those are two uh, species that we have tried to grow here. They're evergreen, and uh, when we saw them come out of the box, they were from a mail order company called Fairweather Gardens. I said, you know, I, I don't, just looking at these two uh, and their kind of shiny, glossy leaves, 
this might be the best they'll ever look here. And of course they died over winter. So the evergreen stewardias used to be taxonomically placed in Hardia, the genus Hardia, but research was done that put them back into stewardia. Now, is it hopeless to grow these? No, not really. I think just more wild species, wild type seed has to be collected. But for the most part, some of these are being propagated and grown in Sonoma in California and then in the deeper regions of the south talking about Florida and then uh, South Carolina so they are being trialed and it's my opinion that you will start seeing these over time and again we'll try to obtain them and again we might kill them but we'll do our best to grow them. The two species though that we are focused on in China are deciduous and that's Stewardia sinensis and Stewardia rostrata. Just like many of the plants that we have at Poly Hill, uh, they have a North American and a Asian origin. So when you look at the distribution in the world, you'll find that there's, as I mentioned before, this uh, disjunct distribution of the genus Stewardia uh, in Asia, Japan, Korea, and China, and then in North America. This is very, very similar to distribution patterns. When we look at this map, we know that in the past there was a land bridge between these two continents right here when the, when the world was all together about 60 to 80 million years ago before continental drift. So this pattern of Eastern Asian relatives of North American species uh, holds true with Stewardia. Our story though starts with two people who have a lot to do with this institution. And that's our director emeritus, Steve Sponberg, who in 1974, produce this uh, monograph, that's what we call an assemblage of species of Asia and North America of the genus Stewardia, a really detailed account uh, based on herbarium review. This is on our website. I'll talk about this a little bit later and guide you to it at the end so you can you know, have access to it. So Steve, as a horticultural taxonomist for 28 years at the Arnold Arboretum, had a lot of research into Stewardia. Uh, Anne had mentioned we're the cold holders of the Plant Collection Network National Collection of Stewardia. Polly, who's pictured here, would go and visit Steve, and Steve and Polly had a mutual affection for many groups, magnolias, stewardias, rhododendrons. Polly would go up to the Arnold Arboretum, particularly Bussy Hill, there, if you haven't been to the Arnold Arboretum, you'll find there just incredible collections, many of them from Ernest Wilson, one of the great plant collectors of our time. Polly would go up there and look at the wild collected plants that were from Korea, Stewardia Suda Camellia in particular, and she didn't have like a little pocketbook, she had like a giant bag, and she would collect tons of seed off of those trees, and virtually all of our Stewardia pseudocamellias here are from those plants at Bussy Hill. And Polly also made collections of Stewardia sinensis and other things. So uh, when I mentioned the Korean origins of pseudocamellia, they, they pretty much start at the Arnold Arboretum, which was the nexus and center for the introduction of Stewardias, particularly the hardy Stewardias. Well, you know our story, if many of you are joining us who, who might not know Polly's story, but she inherited the property with her uh, husband, Julian, in 1958. The property itself was purchased by the family in the 20s. Uh, but in 1958, they acquired the property or took over the property's management from Polly's parents, Howard and Margaret Butcher. And that's where Polly began her experimentation. And so here's 1961 pretty early on in our development, pretty early on in the plantings of the Arboretum. Here in 1977, you see the nursery being developed over here that Polly would use uh, for her production. Uh, you may recall, or you may not know this, but Polly grew everything from seed. And so Polly started sowing seed outdoors. And that's a pretty good way to grow stewardia because they can take anywhere from one year, two years, to five years to germinate, so somewhat finicky. 
So where are we today? This is a drone shot that was taken. The Arboretum has expanded from its original 20 acres to 40 acres to 60 acres to now 72 acres. In 2002, this plot of land was purchased right here. This is the Littlefield House. And here's our production area, which has really improved over time. And it's given us the um, machinery, basically, to experiment with growing uh, Stewardia from seed, which is what we carry on today. So I do want to mention the taxonomy and naming of the genus Stewardia, which is actually kind of interesting. So it was named in honor of John Stewart. Well, who's he? It's not, that's not the host on, on TV that we're talking about. It's actually the third Earl of Butte, which is uh, off of Scotland. And he, it was named in his honor by, by Linnaeus. And so uh, what happened though, which is very, very curious, is Linnaeus misspelled the name. It wasn't uh, as it should be, uh, S-T-U-A-R-T-I-A, -A, which, which was submitted. He actually spelled it as uh, Stewartia with S-T-E-W-A-R-T-I. It's called an orthographical variant, uh, which means that, and in, in, it's funny to, to mention this, it actually has to stay with the plant. So that misspelled genus is conserved according to the Article 61 of the International Code of Botanical Nomenclature, which is extraordinarily boring, and I won't talk further on it, but here's a picture of Lady Jennifer Butte, who visited us in 2010. Her daughter, Diane, I, I had met before. She's a dendrologist from uh, Washington State University, actually a, a, an incredible plant physiologist, and she contacted me and said, look at my I believe it was her grand, it was her daughter who was coming. And so here we are pictured with Stuarty Oveda and, and Lady Jennifer said, is there any way they could figure out how to rename Stuarty the proper way? And I said, you know, I'd talk to Linnaeus and see if he would be open to it, but he just is not answering his phone. So it sticks as Stuartia and uh, life goes on. So the other thing I wanted to say, when, when with Stuartia, there's been opportunities. And so Polly Hill, as you know, had gotten seed either by going up to the Arnold Arboretum, having it sent from friends. But the goal of Polly Hill, since uh, Steve arrived, Steve Spomberg, our director emeritus, and my work is, is to collect seed right from the wild. Why do we do that? That's a lot of work. Well, it's where the origins of the genetics are. That's where you find the greatest likelihood to capture the true diversity of the genus from wild populations. So in 2005, 2007, 2011, I believe, I may be wrong with that, and last year, uh, just this past year, we have gone to Japan to collect. This was my trip in 2005, 1,400 miles an odyssey where I saw both Stewardia pseudocamellia and Stewardia monodelpha. I did not find serrata. Let's talk about the species and the individual species that uh, are under review from Japan in particular. This is one of my favorites. It, it's curious to me, it, I think it is my favorite of the Asiatic Stewardia, and it's Stewardia monodelpha. One thing to note about all the Stewardia is they don't bloom all at once. They bloom in a sequential sequence with some in bloom, some in bud, and some pass. So Stewardia monodelpha has two common names, one called the tall Stewardia, the other one's called the orange bark Stewardia, which is really its claim to fame. But here you can see its distribution throughout the southern half of Japan. Uh, I like the flowers. They're not as showy as pseudocamellia. They're not as big, but they're all characterized uh, really by um, a camellia-like flower, which I'll get into in a moment. We have stunning uh, displays of Stewardia monodelpha, and there's no better way, I think, to grow them than in groves. So at the visitor center, as you leave, you you're walking by, I should say, now we change the entry portal. There's a cluster of Stewardia monodelphas that is just magnificent in the fall and in the winter time. It's, it's truly 
Uh, the bark is truly amazing. So here it is in the fall. Incredible fall color. I'll mention that in Japan, they grow at higher elevations with very steep drainage. And so I believe that they're kind of the toughest Scuwardia. Uh, what I found at least growing here on Martha's Vineyard, they're, most, they're the most adapted species. I believe they're probably the most heat tolerant. Here's the fall color. This is a tree that uh, sprouted near the visitor center that I dug up and planted at my house. It's grown quite well, I love it. It's right outside uh, one of our bedroom windows. So here's the bark and you can see uh, orange bark stuardia is a proper name. A lot of people ask me what's the best form of stuardia and I always say multi-stem because you get more bang for your buck. You got more stems, more beautiful colors, uh, just a terrific plant. The flower I mentioned is five petal light camellia. It's in the T family, the TAC. And so camellias are a close relative. And I'm sure you've heard of Franklinia. So Franklinia is a species in North America, now extinct in the wild, but grown in our gardens, a, a TAC member. What they are is they have these five uh, petals and a boss of golden stamens, um, stigmas that are in fives as well. They produce these woody seed capsules. I'm gonna quickly go through and you'll see a common theme here. How do you cultivate it? Well, I believe this one's the most heat tolerant. It likes full sun, at least at my house, some shade is preferred. Mine has actually morning shade and afternoon sun, so it's quite exposed. Uh, most trees, when they grow, develop uh, naturally a multi-stem habit, which is kind of nice. In general, this is the category I'd put all stewardias in, well-drained, moist, slightly acidic soils. If I had to list a, uh, you know, the quintessential greatest soil ever, it would be well-drained, organic, moist, slightly acidic. Uh, or basic. Uh, so our pH here is 4.5. It's the land of blueberries, so we can grow rhododendrons really well. But while we have uh, <laughs> freely draining soil, uh, it's, it's really dry. We are growing primarily on Martha's Vineyard plants above gravel, and then above the gravel is sand, and then above that is anything, the decomposition of former forest or additives to the soil uh, have happened over time. So we grow plants in very tough conditions. Most vineyarders will tell you that in West Tisbury, um, in our area, if you get into Chilmark and Aquina, there's more clay. Every tree, not just stewardia, should be watered in times of severe drought. How do you water these trees? You put the hose at the base of the tree and you, you leave it as a trickle, and leave it on there for a half hour, um, soak the root ball, um, and that's the best thing you can do, particularly in times of drought, and we're in drought, by the way. While it's mentioned that this tree might get 60 to 80 feet in uh, the wild, mostly here on Martha's Vineyard, in most cultivated situations, 20 to 25 feet. Our flowering period is in June, oftentimes mid-June. The trees that you see available in the nursery trade most often are the Japanese stewardia, uh, it's um, a tree that's been cultivated the longest in terms of its use in North America, and particularly in the nursery trade. Why it is favored is uh, the beautiful expressive bark that you see here. So all different types of patterns of bark. We have a Stewardia Grove, which is quite beautiful here at Poly Hill with multi-stem plants that go back to 1967, 1962. Here's, here's an example of one of the specimens. We truly can grow these plants uh, better than most people, I will tell you, um, they're terrific. The bark in that grove all is different. It's kind of pewter, silver, even green, gold, uh, just spectacular. Now the fall color, and we'll talk about this in a moment, particularly if Korean origin plants is orange to crimson, uh, very beautiful. Here are the seed capsules uh, before they open. 
Now they flower, they form these woody seed capsules that have a pulp. And what happens here, at least what I've seen in, in Monadelpha and Stewardia pseudocamellia, right around the end of February, the chickadees I have found have come and they eat the pulp of these woody capsules and then the seeds drop to the ground. And oftentimes those seeds will germinate after a cold period. So we have, and many of you know from our plant sales, abundant Stewardias for sale. Here's the grove in the fall. Japanese Stewardia also has beautiful buds. They look like they're quilted or knitted together. So this is the bud stage, usually on a stalk. Uh, then they open. And so Pseudocamellia has a, the largest flower in general. I would say actually it's rivaled by Stewardia ovata, or ovata, excuse me. Um, five petals generally, sometimes an extra petal. You can see the bees like it. Here's the boss of stamens. It's, it's a great, great summer flowering tree. Polly named more than one. She collected the seed in Bussy Hill from the Ernest Wilson trees. Uh, she named mint frills. And here it is, an extra whirl of frilly petals. You can see how frilly they are. They can be, they're all generally five petals or sometimes six, but what you see, look at the outer edges of them. They're very beautiful, uh, very graceful. You also see this coloration in the petals, which is kind of limey green. So it's called mint frills. There's another one and the most popular in the nursery trade as a cultivar called ballet. Has very large flowers, nine centimeters in diameter. As far as the description is gracefully uh, spreading branches is better than thinking that it's a weeping tree because it's not. They're kind of arced towards the ground. And, and you know, to be honest, most woodland grown or stewardias that have a long period in shady conditions will have graceful spreading branches. The original plant is mentioned it's from Bussy Hill. Uh, this one was actually registered by Ted Dudley of the National Arboretum. Milk and honey is another one, very similar to mint frills. Uh, flowers are large, they're super large, uh, reddish orange fall color. Um, this is one that has proven difficult to propagate. So getting back to what makes uh, Stewardia pseudocamellia variety coriana, it simply means the origin of the seed of the plants is from Korea. And as I mentioned before, I'm quite convinced, and not just me, but a, a lot of horticulturists, that coriana uh, is what we find in the nursery trade. And the reason is it's the easiest to propagate. Um, it's more vigorous, has larger flowers with a flat display instead of cupped, which is how Japanese story is true from Japan are described more cup flowers. Um, fall color is, is amazing. You saw it in the other slide. It's orange to red, predominant form in the nursery trade. What you see this as being listed as Stewardia coriana, that's wrong. Uh, Stewardia pseudocamellia uh, Korean splendor, which was a, a moniker that was given to all seed grown uh, Stewardia pseudocamellia from Korea. It doesn't really match uh, what, the, what the code of botanical nomenclature requires, which, which is a true clone. Um, but variety coriana is the most widespread, whatever we decide to call it in the end. I do want to mention that there is a hybrid between Pseudocamellia and Monadelpha. Uh, there's a, it was first discovered by the Henry Foundation in Gladwin, Pennsylvania, which also has a really nice magnolia collection. This particular clone was given a, a mo or I'm sorry, this particular cross was given uh, the moniker Henry. So Henry, like the uh, Henry Foundation. Uh, it also is in a nursery trade, this, this particular one. Uh, we do find this occurring frequently at the Arboretum because we brought these two species together. The original plants came from Schumacher Company. Uh, they were from Swarthmore College, uh, the seed, uh, but the original producer, the uh, 
group that sent Swarthmore College the seed was Schumacher, who, who we've used a lot in the past or in our plant records a lot. Skyrocket is upright. Uh, so that makes it a very valuable tree for entryways. It's um, what you might expect though. It's a mix of the two species. When I say that, it has the bark of Pseudo camellia, but the flowers of Monadelpha in this very upright habit. This was uh, discovered by Steve Spomberg and Polly. The cultivation, this is the most commonly cultivated form. It has admittedly the most diverse expressions of bark, incredible array. You know, if you look at our grove of nine trees, you'll just, you go from one to the other. No two are the, alike. Zones five, this is likely the cold, it is the coldest, uh, hardiest plant grown, grown to zone five. At, at Michigan State, we had, uh, when I was working there and as a student, we had a forlorn tree in a courtyard that could grow there with winter protection. Uh, it's not happy in super cold environments. Full sun, but I have to say, any tree could use a little shade um, to get a little rest. Most trees have a multi-stem habit unless they're trained to have a single stem habit and they can be like skyrocket. Again, well-drained moist, slightly acidic soils, uh, drought water. This one gets tall, 30 to 40 feet. When I say that, those are pretty big trees. So our largest tree is nearly 40 feet and it's from 1961. Long flowering period, that sequential bloom, late June to early July here on Martha's Vineyard. Let's look at the stewardias though that are rare in cultivation and not frequently found in the nursery trade. One that we've pursued doggedly and have a hard time finding, stewardia serrata, called uh, the sawtooth uh, stewardia. Uh, stewardia serrata is, uh, as I mentioned before, from Japan. It has the uh, limited distribution compared to monodalpha and pseudocamellia. You can see here too, it has a smaller flower, more like monodelpha, it's cupped. Uh, even the sepals are serrate, you can see that there. You can see this, it's serrate means uh, serrated like a knife blade. So the edge of the leaf has a cut, cut form like a knife blade. Here it is in more detail. Here's the flower open, you can see it is smaller. Also looks a little bit like Stewardia sinensis, which we'll talk about in a moment. There is a clone and very few people have it that originated at the Kalmthout Arboretum in Belgium. And I did see this tree and I wanted to get on the ground and say, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy. It's a beautiful cascading weeping form called Pendula. Um, just a fantastic tree, really hard really hard uh, to clone. Serrata, as I mentioned, has a more of a limited distribution. It's wide, you can see here in southern half of Japan. We did encounter it. In fact, Tom Clark encountered it in 2007. Um, and we had seed and we had seedlings. Stuarda serrata has a a beautiful bark pattern like Stewardia monodelpha, those flowers which I've showed you, and also very good crimson red fall color on specimens that I've come across. So Stewardia, they're maddening in terms of growing them from seed. You can germinate them, yes, but getting them through one to two years overwintering has been a immense struggle. The Arboretum is involved with experimental horticulture, just like Poly Hill. We have the advantage of a greenhouse. We also have uh, these refrigeration systems in our education building and botany lab, which we're testing overwintering seedlings at 40 degrees constantly. Uh, we've noticed that when we do cuttings and we keep it at a constant 40 degrees, those uh, dormancy requirements that have them come out of dormancy successful can be met with, gra or with uh, cloning or cuttings. We're, we're probably going to attempt to do this as well with seedlings to see if that common storage uh, with limited uh, temperature variation holding it at 40 may be the ticket to overcoming 
internal dormancy mechanisms. So typically these plants come out of winter storage, they leaf out and like a balloon deflating, they just drop their leaves and die. Quite sad, very sad, immensely sad. I don't wanna talk about it, I'll start crying. I wanted to tell you a story that like make fantastic bonsai specimens. This is a, uh, a picture of a plant from the uh, National Arboretum, an incredible bonsai collection. Look at that bark. This is a, a tortured plant, obviously, but it um, makes a terrific bonsai. Let's look at some of the other Asiatic species that are in China, Sinensis and Restrata in particular. Stewardia sinensis has this legendary um, reputation for really cool peeling bark, kind of like Acer griseum almost. Uh, this is a photograph by Philippe de Sporberg. I believe this is at a garden in Ireland. Um, and this is what this bark will do. Uh, and so Stewardia sinensis, it is, uh, it, you know, it's, fair, it's not common, but it, it is found in China. It's not rare. And we have specimens here. And we have a specimen in Holly Park that is just incredible that was collected by Peter Daltredici. And it's exhibiting this type of pattern. It's easy to root, again, harder to overwinter but uh, the bark is already starting to do this. It has been pruned masterfully to reveal its bark. So we're so happy that it's in Holly Park. Polly named a tree called Meilishu, which means uh, beautiful tree or my beautiful tree. Uh, I don't actually see what makes it a uh, cultivar, a cultivated variety, that's just, kind of my take on it. It's a small tree. It looks like every other sinensis I've ever seen. Um, the bark is okay. It's, it's not, not great though. It's not as good as monodelphas. Um, some sinensis are. It has this smaller flower. It's way off in the north field. Hardly anybody ever sees it, um, but this is the, the only clone known um, and registered. Chinese Stewardia, same thing. It's uncommon though. It's probably one of the rare trees. Peeling ornamental bark, distinct differences between specimens. I think at some point, if our plant continues to root from cuttings from Peter Daltredici in the Arnold Arboretum, and perhaps we'll name it. Small flowers, which you witness there, easy from seed. Uh, again, kind of a grumpathon with cuttings. Uh, zones five to seven. I would say actually probably zone six on. I don't think Sinensis does all that well in colder regions. Um, I may be wrong. 15 to 25 feet, it is, it is a smaller tree. Uh, full sun, some shade is preferred. When I say full sun, you know, I think most of these trees want six hours of sun, especially for flower production and good fall color. Most trees of this species have um, a multi-stemmed habit, water in times of drought similar to the others. Now this is a story which I find really cool because it shows you the value of herbarium collections. You may know that Polly Hill has a young herbarium, principally for uh, enumerating the flora of Dukes County, the islands around us and, and Martha's Vineyard. However, we also, we also take collections from our collections here, our cultivated collections, and any plant that we collect overseas has an herbarium specimen. And, and the reason being is you're not gonna be able to go back to that specimen and you may not even actually have that specimen produce seed uh, that's successful and grown in your collection ultimately. And this is what happened at the Arnold Arboretum when Steve was doing his monograph in 1974, he started to look at uh, Sinensis that was from Lushan Botanic Garden, uh, was wild seed, it's probably part of their index seminum. And Steve noticed these capsules that were different than the actual Sinensis fruit. And I think I have their Sinensis, so you see it. So he started to look at it and he goes, you know, this is kind of different. This is kind of weird. 
He also looked at the plants that were out in the collections, some of them that did make it through the germination and, and few years stage. And he goes, you know, this is actually a new species. And he named it the beet stewardia. So very similar flowering time, but not the same type of flowers, not the same type of foliage, and not the same type of fruit. So the fruit is why it gets its name, the beet stewardia. The flowers are diminutive here. They're late May, sometimes in June, and they have just this really beautiful, dainty kind of soft rose to pink color. But what makes it the beak stewardia are this, <laughs> this seed that is produced that has a beak. And you can see these fleshy uh, old sepals here that are quite beautiful. Oftentimes they leaf out like this. This is a plant that I uh, saw in a, a garden in Brussels. It was just a, an incredible, beautiful plant, uh, great foliage. But here it is at Polly Hill. The fruits remind me of a crab apple in some ways. A, a crab apples don't have a beak like this, but it has a showy crab apple like stage. Stewardias aren't really known for their beautiful fruit. This one is. What happens to this one after it flowers, right around July, early August, it looks like this, but it will fade and turn brown. So the beak stewardia, we've had it since 2002, I believe, maybe 2004. I'd have to look. It's a small tree, flowers earlier than most of the species, very close to Sinensis, uh, mid-June at the Poly Hill Arboretum. These reddish tinged bracts, the fruit is highly attractive. I, I love this tree. I, I should mention that the foliage is beautiful. It's glossy. The bark is similar to the American species, which is rigid, um, furrowed, not as ornate as the Asiatic species. So, you know, the two na native North American ones are, you know, they you don't grow them for their bark. It's not unattractive, but this one doesn't have attractive bark. It's just so-so. I believe uh, with the foliage of this, as I mentioned, it's kind of glossy. It's, it's not tender, but it doesn't like a lot of wind. Uh, so a specimen that we had in an exposed area was uh, miserable and saying like, why did you put me here? Why do I deserve this? Don't you guys know what you're doing? So that tree actually had such a horrible form that we got rid of it and we have a beautiful specimen right at the visitor center. And I think it's appropriate to be there because Steve named this tree and it's at our entryway. It's undervalued, you should grow it. It's easy to root from cuttings and actually easy to overwinter. Now, stewardias, as I mentioned in Asia, in North America, are closely related uh, that you bring these species back. In fact, that, that's a reference to Steve Sponberg's uh, great book called A Reunion of Trees, where botanic gardens and arboreta bring these disparate species back from Eastern Asia in North America. And they're kind of like, wow, I haven't seen you in a long time. I haven't seen you either. How long has it been? 80 million years. You're looking good. Oh, you're looking good too. Why don't we exchange pollen? play the Marvin Gaye music. But what happens is these trees uh, hybridize and pollinate, okay? So what happened in 2002, uh, Peter Del Tredici was looking at a group of seedlings that were gonna go out for the plant sale. I think I have the story, right? And he goes, well, this one's different. This is really strange looking. Uh, I think I'll pull this back and hold on to it. So he took it and he grew it off site and when it flowered, it had this flower. Like, oh my God, what is this thing? And what it is, it's very cool. It's Stewardia pseudocamellia and Stewardia ovata form grandiflora. And so what it exhibits, like hybrids do, is a mixed bag of uh, phenotypic expression, how the genes express themselves, revealing that it's a hybrid between these two species. So the bark, it's kind of attractive. It's not going to blow you away. It's kind of attractive. It's an upright tree and it has, instead of a golden boss of stamens, it has kind of reddish, well, pinky fuchsia, I guess I would call it. But like Grandiflora, these very frilly, beautiful flowers. It, it's quite a nice plant. 
really hard to cultivate. We planted five, two lived after several years, one became super miserable and uh, we, gave it, uh, we gave it the ax as they say. We have another, a beautiful plant over by the fireplace near the far barn. So Anne mentioned and something we're proud of and something we're working towards continually is to improve and develop our Stewardia collection. We hold with the Arnold Arboretum, the Plant Collection Network, national collection, and that is uh, to assemble the most comprehensive groups of plants within a particular taxon, both species and uh, cultivated plants. I, sh I should mention, quite simply, we seek world domination in Stewardia. I'm going to come out and say that right now. Uh, the PHA holds this with the Arnold Arboretum, and they have been collecting partners with us, along with the Morris Arboretum, in a very uh, strong collaborative going back to 2005. Now I'm gonna to conclude to tell you that there's a lot more to learn about Stewardia. We're learning each year. Um, we'll soon have a paper posted. It has to be edited. It's in the manuscript form. It's from the Southern International Plant Propagators Society meeting last October in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, Todd Ronsville and I produced a paper about dormancy requirements of both the Asiatic and North American species of Stewardia. So we're gaining insights on how to grow these plants. So that'll be posted on our website. But if you go to our National Collection page, it's under plants. You go to plants, you can pull this up. This was a paper that was written June 2008, Stewardy and Cultivation, and it's a summary of a lot of what I've told you today, although um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about cultivated varieties new on the scene. Uh, so on our webpage, you can find that. You can also find Steve's monograph there uh, and a key to all the species. It's a beautiful uh, page. I want to tell you, though, what encapsulates the Arboretum's philosophy of growing plants from seed is the same thing that entranced Polly Hill. We're trying to connect and collect uh, these plants and grow them uh, as seedlings to reveal their genetic potential. And oftentimes you'll get variation, which is what, why you grow plants from seed. So Polly, we didn't have the advantage of, uh, a, she didn't have the advantage of a greenhouse. It's sowing right in the ground. Here she is right here. Or actually, I think that's her. Uh, and under shaded lap and waiting one, two, three, four, five years for germination. So we're patient like Polly. Here is the story of how patient. This is a seedling that undoubtedly came from the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, but their source undoubtedly, I should say, was the Korean variety Coriana, or what we're calling this like seed from Korea now. Planted in front of an old barn, which is now gone. Uh, it, was, uh, it was called the Jim. As a small seedling in 1961, and on the card it says barnyard seedling, in a slightly raised bed, and here it is a little bit later in this faded uh, Polaroid taken here. And maybe this tree is like 12 feet tall. And then it grew and it grew fast. This is in 2010. Still, that's the gym. Now this building is the education building. Uh, really beautiful fall color though, revealing the Korean type, kind of orange, crimson, red fall color. Very vigorous plant. Incredible bark beautiful exfoliating bar. Uh, when we built the new building, we pushed it six feet away from the trunk of this tree to protect the tree and we fenced the tree, watered it. It did inevitably find, have some damage, but we kept the stone wall behind it. We didn't pull it off. Roots like walls, you would like, they really do know that condensation gathers on walls. Uh, and so roots like condensation, and so roots will grow right up to a wall and the spider on it. Here it is in the winter. Uh, amazing tree. People pull into our parking lot, particularly plantsmen, 
who are staying at the cow barn and they're like, oh my God, look at that tree. I can't believe that's a stewardia. But everything about it in most of this group, from the branches that are so delicate, the tracery that you see here, the bark, the buds, the flower, the expression of the bark, the fall color, the elegant foliage. I mean, this is a four season tree. Everybody should grow stewardia. I know you're going to buy some at our plant sale now that I've convinced you of this. So what are we doing with Stewardia? Well, a lot. Uh, we're hoping to, and I uh, credit leadership on this to Elizabeth Thomas, our plant recorder, to assemble the definitive checklist of all Stewardias in cultivation and their cultivated varieties. And it's actually a fun job, but I will tell you, uh, the International Code of Botanical Nomenclature for Cultivated Plants isn't as strict as the strict species code, so they don't abide by the same articles and uh, rules of naming. What you find is a lot of plants that haven't been published in the, in the right way to obtain cultivar status. So, we are the International Cultivar Registration Authority for the genus Stewardia, and Liz Thomas has put together, and this will be improved eventually on our website after it's published, not before, um, the, the exhaustive list of, of every known uh, Stewardia. Some of them that we have that we're cultivating here at Poly Hill, uh, I'll mention Ballet, our most popular tree, the most popular clone in the industry. Lindstrom's Weeping, which, which shows a weeping habit. Milk and Honey, which you met already, Mint Frills. One that is super cool is called Pewter, which has this kind of glaucous, really bluish, greeny foliage. It even looks good right now. Um, it usually fades by now to kind of a dull green, but Pewter is a, a Guy Meacham introduction. We'll try to work with him to get it registered. Pillar Bella is an upright form by Crispin's creations of Stewardia pseudocamellia. Uh, Ristrata, we have both of these. Rippingale Rose is out in the collections and it, it shows very similar to Ristrata, the straight species uh, rose uh, colored um, coloration on the petals. Not, not dominating, but it's a very nice plant. And then Sunrise, which I think will be a good plant, but it's in our nursery uh, in full sun. And it's like, hey, yo, you got to get me out of this full sun. And I'm not, and this doesn't look good. So I think it will, it still has a yellow <laughs> color and it's, it, that doesn't mean it's chlorotic, but it's, it has yellow foliage. And I think we'll plant it out uh, this fall or next spring. Still trying to get Pendula. We've had it imported in through uh, American Plant Health Inspection Service and USDA, and they've never arrived from Belgium in live condition. Kind of a bummer. Um, plants that we get shipped from overseas, they get in and they're dead. They're dried out. The people at USDA can let them sit on the counter. Not always, but it does happen. It's kind of too bad. Scarlet Sentinel we have in our collections, May Lee Shu, I already mentioned, and Skyrocket. So go to our website, you'll find a lot. What you'll see is uh, Steve's monograph is turned into a key. His monograph is there. Many other sources, particularly from Arboretum Westphalar in Belgium, which is a, a, a collaborative that we've had for a long time, a fantastic collection of not, not just Stewardias, but one of the great collections in the world. Uh, so go to that website and check it out. I give credit to that to Tori Stewart, who put it together when she was curatorial intern some years ago, and also Liz's uh, latest work on the registration. Where do you get them? Common question. Uh, Broken Arrow Nursery, they have been a cooperative group with us. We've sent them cuttings. They've come down to get cuttings. They have Scarlet Sentinel. Uh, they typically have uh, also some of the other Pseudocamellias Ballet and others. Right now, you can go to their website. They don't have their active shipping schedule up for mail order, and I presume many of you would want it mail order. Forest Farm, I should mention Broken Arrow Nursery is in Hamden, Connecticut, so it's not 
not, not that far from uh, Boston. Forest Farm Nursery is far away, it's in Oregon, and they have Stewart is, and that's a place where you can buy small plants. It's a really cool place, it's been going on forever. Rare Fine Nursery is a, is a great nursery, still does mail order, uh, also has incredible magnolias, inchianthus, coralopsis, rhododendrons, Rare Fine, you can look up and see uh, on their website. Also, I should mention, it didn't make it on here, but Camellia Forest. Uh, Camellia Forest is definitely worth looking at. Um, I should also mention they do have uh, Gordonia and Gordlinia, which are uh, Stewardia relatives, which are unique and interesting that you might want to try. Plant Mad Nursery is a wholesale nursery. Uh, if you had enough people interested, you could um, go to your local nursery and ask them to contact Plant Mad to wholesale in some of these cultivars. That's where Pewter comes from. And then wholesale, uh, Plant Mad, I'm sorry, is retail. All these other ones are retail, I should mention, but wholesale, heritage seedlings and liners. They have been a, a champion of Stewardia for years. Holly Hill Arboretum is working with Heritage to try to uh, perfect a grafting technique where we graft actually the North American steward is onto Asiatic rootstock. So that'd be fun to see if that can happen so we can get the North American species out in the nursery trade. So I ran through that fairly quickly and I appreciate you holding on and enduring it. Uh, I do want to, before we get to the questions, tell you about a special presentation that's happening next Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. My friend Rodney Eason is the CEO of the Mount Desert Land and Garden Preserve in Bar Harbor, Maine. And I have been there uh, over the last uh, three years, a, a couple of times I gave a talk there last year and the year before as a visitor. It's a remarkable garden. Uh, it's a Rockefeller garden that <clears throat> has been, you know, really opened up to the public and made more accessible. And Rodney's doing a great job assembling, uh, and he has a Cracker Jack staff. Um, it's a plant intensive garden. It's one of the most beautiful gardens I've been to in terms of when you're there, one of the gardens, and it's, it's actually, a, a lot of it's a mixed border of annuals and perennials and dahlias, the most colorful borders that you'll come across, particularly contrasted with the sky of Maine, which is so blue. Uh, this is a lecture that is in honor of Lucina and Frank Hoke. Frank was the original chairman of the Poly Hill Arboretum way back in 1998, and Lucina uh, was on our board for several years, both champions of the Arboretum and believers, more importantly than ever now, believers in science. So we're so thankful for them that they're responsible for our greenhouse and a lot of our growth here. So join us next week. You can see where to register and we'll send you information on this. I would say we can get to the questions now because my next slide is that. What is your questions? And let me get my self back on here. Yeah. There you go. Hi. <laughs> All right. So let's take a look at some of the questions that we got. Um, and folks, if you have anything else, feel free to type them in. Um, so our first question is a two-parter. Um, this person asks, my stewardia did not bloom this summer. It looks healthy. I don't fertilize it. Have watered it several times this week. Usually blooms very well each summer for years. So I think that question is, any idea why it might not be blooming? The only thing I can think of, and I will mention, this has been a poor year for uh, Polly Hill stewardia's blooms across all the species. And I think it has something to do with the mild winter that we had. Um, I think that some of the floral maturation happens over the winter. And some of that also requires uh, 
temperatures and the gradient of temperatures to slowly get lower and lower and lower. So our pseudocamellias in particular were just, I think maybe 25% in bloom, some less. So I believe that that is an environmental problem that's unique to this past winter. And the fact that your tree is already flowered in the past and reliably, I, I have to attribute it to that, just the quirky winter that we had. Okay, and you might have a similar answer to the second part of the question. Um, while we're on the subject of not blooming, my cornus cusa, which bloomed hugely last year, had no blooms at all, nor did my calmia. Any ideas? I think it's the same thing. <laughs> it's, it's ironic. I don't know if you're on Martha's Vineyard, but um, I would say our cusas were wimpy this year. Our calmias were not great. Um, we had some native calmias that were from the island that did really well. But I think it's related again to the environmental uh, weirdness of the temperature uh, gradient this past winter. We, we really didn't get very cold for a long period of time. So I, I think this year uh, was not great. I will tell you though, the year prior, uh, and particularly two years ago, it, it, we had prolific blooms. So I think it's related to winter, all, all those, the Kusas and the Kalmias as well. We see, we saw that here. Okay. So it's not your fault, folks. <laughs> no, and you don't need to fertilize it. <laughs> and um, and a similar question about um, a, a pseudo camellia, which did not bloom in West Tisbury this year, and whether that's typical. So it sounds like not typical, but specific to this year's conditions. Yeah, I think it it's um, in West Tisbury in particular at my home garden. This even monodelpha, which is usually prolific, very wimpy, very few flowers. Okay. Um, next question. Um, will there be a fall sale or can we purchase them today? I think I can answer that question. Um, we will be having a fall sale, which we'll be advertising shortly. It's going to open up on September 15th and run through October 12th. Um, any of you who purchase plants at our spring plant sale, it's going to be really similar. Um, you're going to order from our online website, select a pickup time. We'll have bays set up in our parking area. Um, and you'll come and do a contactless pickup uh, at your appointed time. So the second part of that question is, what varieties of Stewardia will be available for sale? And I don't know if you know this yet, Tim. Yeah, we're, I think predominantly, we're just gonna have the species Monodelpha and Stewardia pseudocamellia. We may have, get your order in soon, mm -hmm. uh, we may have some cultivated varieties of, of those, but, but what we'll do is we'll make an effort to, to assemble more species or cultivated varieties and propagate them. So we did take cuttings of all of them this year. And I mentioned before this paper that came out, we're gonna overwinter them in, a, in the refrigeration system that we've shown to have success before, uh, where the plants get through the cold period and we pull them out of the refrigerator in the spring and they leaf out and do well. So we do have some of those. I also think we have, which is quite rare in Stewardius, is actually Stewardio Veda. Not many of them. So once those go up, uh, you'll be notified. Um, if Anne has mentioned before, a lot of you are subscribed to our mailing list. Just, you know, be ready um, and we'll eventually have those plants listed and you can order them. They're, they're very nice plants. And the straight species, I, I encourage you to try to grow monodelpha if you just have pseudocamellia because it's a, a, a well-adapted plant for Martha's Vineyard. All right, and for anyone who is not subscribed to our email newsletter, I just put the link in the comments. Um, that's really the best way to stay up to date on 
all of our happenings and announcements about our plant sale. Um, so next question is, do you have to manage for any diseases or pests? The only thing that we get on store is, is Japanese beetle. So, and it's a little frustrating because they're not really eating the foliage. They're actually like to eat the pollen. So certain years we'll see the Japanese beetle just maul the central boss of stamens, and it's kind of annoying. Uh, it, it's kind of not been bad for us in recent years. I will say, as far as other pests, I, the Arboretum is working on a publication that <laughs> is in high demand called, uh, well, we're gonna call it Plants Not Favored by Deer. Uh, for the most part, Stewardias are not bothered by deer. This particular year for island residents, it coincided with this past fall with a very low acorn production year. So we have had deer browse, minimal deer browse on Stewardia for the very first time. Um, but what you want to do is when a tree is young is cage it uh, just to be careful and get it up to size so if it's browsed, it can continue to grow and sprout out. Uh, but that's the only other real pest. There's not a lot of things that afflict Stewardia. I will tell you though, they don't like root disturbance. So if you're doing a renovation in and around your house, uh, protect the root system. They're mostly, like the majority of trees, the roots are in the top 10 inches of the soil. So if you're working around a Stewardia, be cognizant that you know you can hurt it by damaging the roots if you cultivate around it. All right. So um, a question about Stewardia cinnamon and whether you mentioned it and whether you know anything about it. Can you say that again? Stewardia cinnamon. Cinnamon. I've not heard it of okay. it. Um, um, Warren, if you want to elaborate on your question, feel free to type it in. Um, next question. Uh, did you finish the story about Franklinia? Are they also in the tea family? Yes, uh, Franklinia is in the tea family. I can tell you very briefly that the story goes like this. It was collected in the late 1700s by John Bartram along the Alatmaha River in Georgia. He found a small population there, uh, sent the seed over as a contractor, uh, contracted by the British Crown to collect it. He sent it over to Britain. He also brought it back to Philadelphia to what is now called the Bartram Gardens, uh, one of the first botanic gardens in the United States established in the late 17, early 1800s. He grew it there, they grew it in England. Years later, uh, people said, well, why don't you go back and get more seed? Let's see what's happening with Franklinia. It was named after or in honor of Benjamin Franklin. They went back to that site and lo and behold, Franklinias were gone, extinct in the wild. So. It's kind of an interesting thing. There's a publication that came out that's called Red List of Theaceae, uh, species, woody species within the camellia family. And it's interesting to read the fact that the only place now to find Franklinia is in our gardens. And so that's kind of the story of why botanic gardens in a sense are racing against time to collect plants in the wild and grow them. We don't know what happened to Franklinia. Uh, a lot of people think that actually this, and I, I can't verify this, but in and around that time, tobacco was being widely introduced and cultivated in uh, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, as we're all aware, and that a soil-borne disease uh, related to uh, the cultivation of tobacco may have led to the demise of Franklinia. There's no proof of that, but when you talk to Southern nurserymen, they talk about the problems that happened uh, with the introduction of tobacco. But Franklinia is a fantastic plant. There's a Franklinia census. You can Google this and see 
I'm not sure if it's still active. I could probably find the PDF and, and put it on our website. I'd be happy to do that. That traces the largest and biggest Franklinias in the United States and where they're found. It's pretty cool, actually, that it's growing. I love the tree. They're very finicky. <laughs> we have, I think, in my time here, I think we've planted at least three that have died, but we have one big plant that Polly planted years ago. What, what's cool about it is it flowers at now, or really in about a week or two, and then goes all the way into October. Great. So we just had a couple more people adding that they also are on the vineyard. Um, and did not have good blooms on their trees this year. So those of you who struggled with blooms, you are not alone. Fingers crossed for a better season for blooms next year. I would say that 2020 is not a great year. <laughs> <laughs> um, There's sharks out in the water. Yeah. It'll okay, let's see. Um, and then we have a follow-up from Warren who is asking, about the cinnamon, he wrote, there are a few cinnamon bark trees right before Polly's playpen. Does that mean anything to you, Tim? Yeah, those are monodelphas. And they, they also have the name orange bark stewardius. They, they're fantastic. That group, I'm not sure, Warren, but I think they might have been in the same seed lot. I'd have to check. I, can't, I can verify it as the ones from the Barnes Foundation. So m a lot of our monodelphas come from the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia, uh, which is an incredible art uh, gallery now. And the old uh, Barnes Foundation also hosted a horticultural school where Polly Hill went to school uh, to learn about Stewardy and other plants. So. That is the orange bark, and actually, I have heard it commonly called cinnamon bark. I love it. I love. I think it's the the best bark um, in the winter, and we have them for sale. <laughs> All right, and then the last question, which I think you did talk a little bit about, is: Do we um, cultivate stewardias? Do we collect and cultivate seeds from the PHA? Franklinia for sale? Uh, I don't think we have any now. I'm pretty sure we don't. Um, but however, that seed hasn't always been that great. And I, I'm not certain of this, but I have a, a, a magnificent connection in Swarthmore. And uh, there's a huge tree. It's nearly 40 feet. It's got to be at least that big near the president's house in Swarthmore, and it reliably produces massive amounts of seed. So in the past, we have gotten that. And so what I'll do is I'll get a hold of my, uh, my contact and get seed sent. The tree here, the seed, for whatever reason, hasn't been as abundant, um, for whatever reason. And, but we'll try both and see how they do. Now, we can root them from cuttings, but again, they're actually worse than typical stewardy in terms of their success, but they can easily be grown from seed. If, uh, if, it's, if it's you, Warren, or anybody who would like to try some, uh, you're welcome to contact us. I can put them in a little envelope and give you the exact instructions on how to grow it yourself. Not, not hard at all, actually. It was Susan Murphy that asked that question. Okay, well, I can do that for her. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then one last comment from Barbara. Um, I have a Franklinia I bought last fall at your plant sale. It's doing really well and ready to bloom. Oh, so, that's incredible. Yeah, so that's great news. Yeah, so we'll check for y'all and just see if we have any. I, I did know we had it last year, but we'll take a look. And if we do, they'll certainly be uh, posted on our, um, our, our plant sale. We, we really uh, worked hard to produce that for you all, um, particularly Bridget and plant propagation and our staff and everybody making that online uh, sale happen. And we're pleased to do it. So. I should, we should also mention there'll be a steep discount 
I won't tell you, you'll have to <laughs> have to hang in there, but deeper than normal. Look out for an announcement coming next week. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So if anyone else thinks of questions after the fact, feel free to email info at polyhillarboretum.org and we'll get back to you. Um, and thanks for joining us today. And thank you, Tim. Thank you, Anne. Thanks, everybody. Y'all stay safe and healthy, okay? And I hope you're all doing well. <laughs>